All right, guys, it's time to have the conversation about the 8,312 brain dead takes that have been floating around the internet since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now, uh, before we get into this, let me just say, please catch up on all the news on Russia and Ukraine. I've done a number of segments trying to detail like every little thing that's going on, and it gives you a, a, a good idea of the, the contours of this uh, this war and the complexities and the nuances, and I feel like all that stuff is important. Um, this is more low-hanging fruit type stuff, but it's also important to talk about. I mean, I warned you. I told you guys. I told you guys, I think in one of the first videos we did since the invasion was announced, that you gotta buckle up, because there's gonna be so many bad takes floating around, and the amazing thing about this, as you'll see, is there's bad takes of every variety from every ideological perspective. It's kind of incredible how, like, brain-dead people are. It's wild. So anyway, let's jump into it. Joy Behar moans Russia-Ukraine war is making her vacation plans uncertain. Well, thank you, Joy. We appreciate that. I watched the entire clip, by the way, on The View, and, uh, it's like, it's even worse than it sounds. Like, it's even worse than this headline indicates. She's very much like, you know, I've been planning to go to Italy for a while, and, you know, it was postponed because of COVID, and now it's postponed because of this. And, like, the first thought she had was in regards to herself being mildly inconvenienced. As we have an outright invasion, a war, thousands of people dead, soldiers dead, civilians dead. An escalation towards World War III, uh, you know, a slate of sanctions being unleashed, the likes of which I'm not sure I've ever seen. I mean, maybe you could say on Iran or Venezuela or Cuba, um, but, it, like, they're, this is terrifying. And her first thought was like, oh my god, my vacation is mildly inconvenienced, oh good. God, it's so... It, it's just, it's a very American-centric mindset, isn't it? It's such an entitled mindset. Israelis protest against Russian occupation of Ukraine from occupied Palestine. Okay, so let's be clear about this one here. It is based to protest the Russian invasion and Russian occupation. They're wantonly violating international law. So they're correct about what Russia is doing, but of course, they are incorrect about what they are and what they're doing. They're a settler colonialist. I, I can't talk. It's early, guys. Give me a break. They are a settler, colonialist, apartheid state. And they're illegally occupying Palestinian territory, and they've been for decades. So, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's brazen hypocrisy. It's astounding. Like, how do you not realize this hypocrisy? And there's going to be a number of examples like this as well. Let's continue here. Kim Iverson says, Ukraine shouldn't fight back. No one should. Let it go. If Ukraine fights back, it will be devastating, and the outcome won't be any different. They can't fight Russia on this. No one can. Best to let it go for now and use democracy in the future. Don't kill yourselves. Seriously. Ukraine shouldn't fight back. No one should. Let it go. I mean, that's, that's astounding. They are being invaded. There is an illegal and offensive invasion happening. And her advice is, don't use your right of self-defense. If Mexico or Canada invaded the U.S., would she say this? Would anybody in the U.S. say this? Absolutely not. Absolutely. In fact, we could even use more controversial examples. I said this during the Iraq War, that we have to make a distinction between people who are fighting the West and killing innocent people, and, you know, trying to do a global caliphate. So we need to make a distinction between, like, Al-Qaeda and ISIS, and regular Iraqis who are fighting to try to keep an imperialist invasion out of their country. Those are distinctly different things. One of them is uh, Iraqis fighting for liberation from an occupier, doing self-defense, 
And the other one is, you know, terrorism to establish a global caliphate. Now, that may have been a controversial take of mine at the time, but it was an accurate take. And, you know, I say the same thing now. Of course, Ukraine has a right to self-defense. By the way, think about, like, Joe Biden even said, um, we'll have to see what Russia does. If it's like a little incursion into the eastern region, the, like, separatist-held territory, well, that's one thing. So even Biden was admitting in a situation like that, like, okay, maybe that's categorically different. It's similar to, you know, a Crimea-type situation. Maybe we respond one way if that happens. But that's not what happened. They are invading all of Ukraine. They're invading Kiev. They're trying to take over a sovereign country. Now, regardless of what you think about how we got to this point, with NATO expansion, for example, Putin gave a speech where he made crystal clear this isn't just about NATO expansion. The first half of his speech was a blood and soil portion of his speech. It was about wanting to resurrect Russia's imperial ambitions. Don't take my word for it. Go listen to his speech. He said it. So your suggestion is just lay down in a chalk outline of yourself on the ground and let an imperial power take you over? I mean, that's... Uh, it's absurd. And she got ratioed to high, high heavens for this for good reason. Next. The Taliban called on Russia and Ukraine to resolve the crisis through, quote, peaceful means. They just militarily took over a, go a government. It's hilarious they're saying this. They asked both countries to safeguard Afghans in Ukraine. Ukrainian troops evacuated nearly 100 Afghans to Kiev after the fall of Afghanistan's government in August. So, I mean, they literally just took over a government with force. Like, they just did it. <laughs> it, was, it was super recent. <laughs> And now they're like, look, 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 we can't do any military invasions, guys. Come on. What are you doing? This is crazy. You got to be peaceful. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. It's am now, by the way, again, I'll say the same thing about this that I said about the Israel thing. I mean, the Taliban is correct. <laughs> you should use peaceful means. But, you know, peaceful means should have been used in uh, Afghanistan, too. Now, I get it. It was a, you know, corrupt U.S.-backed puppet government that was, uh, you know, in control in Afghanistan, but that doesn't mean, like, coups are bad, so now I will do my coup. You know? It's bad when others are authoritarian, so now I will be authoritarian to combat how bad authoritarianism is. Yeah, Guys, you have to think about, like, all these conflicts. You have to think about them not as a matter of, like, what side am I on? You have to think about it as a matter of, like, principles and international law and trying to be objective and have standards that apply to everybody. Now, unfortunately, very few people do that. But anyway, this is what the Taliban said. Let's continue here. This is really something. On the left is the, economy, the, the economist after Bush invaded Iraq. On the right is the economist after Putin invaded Ukraine. Spot the difference. So when Bush waged war on Iraq, illegal, by the way, offensive, they didn't have weapons of mass destruction. They weren't a threat to the U.S. Now, the waging of peace. When it's Putin, where will he stop? So, you know, it's like... On this side, oh, purely peaceful. Aren't the Americans the good guys by definition? On this side, it's like Vladimir Putin is basically Hitler, and this is like the Sudetenland being taken. So, I mean, this barely, this doesn't even require any commentary. You guys could see how absurd it is. The fact of the matter is, the invasion of Iraq was illegal and offensive, despite the boatload of rationalizations that they trotted out. And the invasion of Ukraine is illegal and offensive, despite the boatload of rationalizations that they trotted out. Nathan J. Robinson is uh, showing this article here. This Quebec restaurant removed poutine from its menu in solidarity with Ukraine. From now on, we are the inventor of cheese sauce fries. So poutine is, you know, a very famous uh, Canadian dish fries and it has, you know, a bunch of stuff on it. And uh, Putin sounds too much like Putin for these people. So they're like, okay, no, we, we can't sell that anymore. I mean, come on, guys. I know it's like a weird attempt to try to show solidarity with Ukrainians. I understand the place where it's coming from, but this is absurd. It's ridiculous. I mean, and you're going to see, again, you're going to see a lot more headlines like this as I continue here, or, you know, similar themes. But I don't know why there always has to be just a brain-dead, over-the-top, irrational, illogical backlash to stuff where you swing the pendulum way too far in the other direction. People just, they can't help but be incredibly tribal. This is just so stupid. This one is one of the worst to me. Uh, Andrew Yang says, America has problems, but one has to know that international stability and norms have been reinforced by American power and decency for years, and the alternative is dark and playing out before ours. Andrew, www.shuddy.com. 
This is completely factually false. Completely factually false. It's it's provable. It's verifiable. The United States violates international law on a Tuesday before breakfast. I mean, we do it as a, as a matter of routine. It's standard operating procedure. Of course, Iraq is the clearest example. The illegal and offensive invasion that killed hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians. We occupied that country. By the way, we're still in that country. We did Guantanamo Bay. We did Abu Ghraib. We did torture that we learned from communist Chinese manuals on how to torture. We put Japanese soldiers to death because they tortured our soldiers uh, by doing waterboarding. And then we waterboarded and said, no, it's totally legal when we do it. It's just enhanced interrogation. We have the illegal drone war, which was, you know, rampant under the Obama administration and the Trump administration. Now, thankfully, Biden has reeled that in a little bit. But still, there's been no accountability. 90% civilian death rate for that. We have, like... I don't even know the number, anywhere from 700 to 900 military bases all around the world. We're currently backing a genocide in Yemen. Saudi Arabia, our top ally, is doing a genocide in Yemen, and we're helping them with that. We're occupying part of Syria and just jacking their oil, and we're open about that fact. We talk about that fact. Trump talked about that fact. The list goes on and on. Look at what we're doing to Afghanistan right now with the sanctions. Starving millions of people. Guys... Our crimes matter. These are real people being impacted by U.S. crimes as well. So understand something. I'm not making this point to do a deflection, to obfuscate, to do, to obscure, to do whataboutism about, about what Russia is doing in Ukraine. Ultimately, what Russia is doing is imperialism. It is aggression. It is illegal under international law. It needs to be curtailed. You need to sanction Putin and the oligarchs. You need to pull out every... A measure imaginable that doesn't escalate to deter him. So I'm not doing this to do whataboutism. But what I'm saying is, this is an idiotic reaction that is factually wrong. You can't just say, well, now all the things we did don't count. And by the way, we were just trying to bring about international stability and norms, and American power is about decency. That's just wrong, Andrew. That's just, And it's a shame, because, you know, I think Andrew Yang means well. I really do. Even after all this time, I think the guy generally... Means well. Let's see what you said in response. International stability and norms have been reinforced by American power DC for years. Laugh my fucking ass off, 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 off. Correct, Shu. That is correct. So, God, Andrew, come on, man. Get it together. What the hell is this? Jesus Christ, bro. Eric Swalwell floats kicking Russians out of U.S. universities in retaliation to Putin invading Ukraine. So, Eric Swalwell looks at what's going on and steps up and says, How about we try rampant bigotry and xenophobia? How about we make bigotry and xenophobia a matter of policy against Russians in the United States? This guy, by the way, is was one of the biggest idiots totally drunk on Russiagate. All the false stories around Russiagate. And look, you can see where it led him. It led him to this kind of black and white thinking. This bigoted worldview. Like, Russians bad. And so let's implement that as a matter of policy. So pathetic. So pathetic. All right, more. Adam Kinzinger says, The fate of Ukraine is being decided tonight, but also the fate of the, the West. Declare a no-fly zone over Ukraine at the invitation of the sovereign government. Disrupt Russia's air ops to give the heroic Ukrainians a fair fight. It's now or later? I don't know if he was trying to say it's now or never, but whatever. He said now or later. Uh, that's a candy, by the way, now or later. Um, okay, so here's why this is really, really, really dumb. If the U.S. enforces a no-fly zone over Ukraine, that means the United States shoots down Russian airplanes over Ukraine. That is a direct military confrontation, an act of war from one nuclear-armed power against another. Adam Kinziger, you have the IQ of a ferret. Like, what are you talking about? This is why one of the main reasons why Biden has been clear from the beginning, like, no American boots on the ground, no American boots on the ground, we're acting in a way that we, we say is defensive, it's defensive, it's defensive. He's been clear about that for the very simple reason, if there's any miscommunication in the fog of war, and we think there's direct military confrontation between the two, the two nuclear-armed states, you are gambling with a nuclear strike and nuclear winter, and, you know, the annihilation of millions of people. I mean, how dumb do you have to be to not think this through? This isn't like a difficult thing to think through. This is like, you know, basic stuff. 
If you're not talking about like sixth, seventh, eighth order consequences here, this is like a second or third order consequence we're talking about. And this moron is like, we just shoot down Russian planes. I don't understand what the problem is with that. I mean, I, I can't. Uh, these, he's an idiot. He's an idiot. He is so dumb. He's as dumb as it gets. He's as dumb as rocks. And these kinds of like hardcore neocon hawks have been controlling U.S. foreign policy for a while, which is part of the reason why we are where we are. Now, it's not the whole reason because Russia has imperial ambitions and Putin made that clear in his speech the other night. But if we had done what we can do in de-escalating the situation, namely not expand NATO to Russia's doorstep, well, then maybe we would be in a better situation. We don't know for sure. You know, we, we, we can't tell an alternate history timeline, but I wish we did what we could have done simply so that if Vladimir Putin did indeed continue to do what he's doing, then the entire world would admit it, even Russia and China, okay, this doesn't have anything to do with NATO, this is just rank aggression and imperialism, and that's proven because they gave Putin what he said was his biggest concern, which is chill with NATO. God, this guy's so stupid, holy shit. New York Post says Russian vodka pulled from shelves in U.S., Canada bars, and liquor stores. Every small thing makes a difference. Um, so blame all Russians. Blame some random Russian companies for the actions of Vladimir Putin and a corrupt authoritarian government. What is wrong with people? What is wrong? With, you'd think we would have gotten past like these this way of thinking at this late date, but we haven't. But we haven't. For the love of God, it's not the fault of your average Russians. It's not. And I oppose any policy measure that cracks down on your average Russians. You know, I'm all in favor of sanctioning the oligarchs. I'm all in favor of sanctioning Putin to the high heavens. I'm all in favor of defensive weapons for Ukraine as long as it doesn't go to the Azov Battalion, the neo-Nazis. Like, those, those are the things that I'm in favor of, but if you want to do further sanctions and you want to, like, hurt Russian civilians and you want to be bigoted towards... Russians and Russian products here in the U.S. I mean, that's just... How do I have to come out here and oppose this in the year 2022? It's astounding. But this is the reaction. It's a massive overreaction. It reminds me of in the wake of 9-11, when there was a massive up uptick in discrimination and hate crimes against, like, brown people in the U.S. Anybody who looked, like, vaguely Arabic or Muslim. I mean, there were massive spikes in hate crimes against Sikhs and Hindus in the U.S., because a bunch of people just thought, like, yeah, they're Muslim, and that's close enough. And by the way, it's not justified... It's not justified to go after, you know, <laughs> regular Muslims, like, average people. <laughs> you know, th they didn't do it. So even if it was targeted against Muslims, that's still stupid, and that's still wrong. But there was just an uptick of hate crimes against Hindus, Sikhs, Muslims, and any, like, vaguely brown-skinned people who looked Arabic in the United States. And this is like a, you know, this it didn't hasn't risen to that level yet, but who knows, man, what what'll happen? This is a little uh, sign of negative things to come here. All right, and then we have 62% of Americans think Putin wouldn't have invaded Ukraine if Trump were president. Here's why this is stupid: Putin invaded Georgia under George W. Bush. George W. Bush is very similar to Donald Trump on paper, like kind of crazy, kind of idiotic. Uh, psycho Republican, warmonger, you know, and like they both fit that description perfectly. So obviously, like a hardline hawkish right wing president um, doesn't deter Putin because it didn't deter Putin. Now, he also happened to not do this under Trump. What are the specific reasons for that? I have no idea. But the idea that he would under no circumstances do it under Trump, I think that's kind of silly. I think if Trump had won the 2020 election, you know, this same thing probably would have happened here. Uh, now, some people say, oh, well, you know, Trump had said critical things about NATO in the past, so maybe Putin wouldn't have invaded. But again, I think we've already established this isn't just about NATO. I think that's a part of it. I definitely don't think it helped. Um, but in Putin's long speech, half the speech had nothing to do with NATO. It was about historical grievances against Ukraine. It was about wanting to resurrect uh, a Russian empire and return it to its former glory. It was about criticizing the Soviet Union and saying, hey, you guys made a shitty deal with Ukraine and all these other now post-Soviet states because you let them leave, no questions asked. They took advantage of us. You know, we funded them. We propped them up. They're in massive debt to us, and now they're going to pay that debt back. So it wasn't just about NATO anyway. And by the way, Trump actually 
funded the neo-Nazis on the ground in Ukraine. And Trump had a NATO buildup on Russia's border, and they were doing, um, quote-unquote, defensive drills. He also axed the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. So in many ways, he was hawkish, which you, could argue, which you can argue uh, got us more likely to this point, got us closer to this point, escalated to this point. Again, I don't think that's the whole picture, but I think that's part of the picture. And Trump really stayed with the same policy approach as virtually every other U.S. president. And we are where we are. So I think if Trump got a second term, he probably would have invaded. Uh, Putin would have invaded. But 62% of Americans think uh, that that wouldn't have happened. Okay, next. Uh, the, I'll leave you with these. There's a couple examples of this I have for you, but this is really brazen stuff here. In the space of a few hours, we've gone from civilized Europeans to blonde-haired, blue-eyed people dying. All this mental gymnastics to avoid saying white people are dying. So yeah, on, on the BBC, talking to a Ukrainian official, somebody in Ukraine, and they basically say, like, I can't believe this is so terrible because we see blonde-haired and blue-eyed people dying. Um, yeah, this is that Eurocentric view that is very disturbing. So in other words, all the crimes against the Yemeni people, the people in Afghanistan, the people in Iraq... Like, all those are totally discounted and, like, hand-waved away. And people are like, well, now this matters because it's blonde-haired, blue-eyed people who are dying. And it's like, actually, all of it should matter. All of it does matter. The lives of a Yemeni civilian are just as important as the lives of a Ukrainian civilian. But, like, the media is definitely not taking that line. They're saying that this is, you know, the reason why this matters is because they're blonde-haired and blue-eyed, which is, you know sort of creepy and the direct link to eugenics when you bring up something like blonde hair and blue eyed and the so-called Aryan race. Um, here's another one. Look at the underlined portion here. They seem so like us. This is what makes it shocking. Ukraine is, so, is a European country. It's people watch Netflix and have Instagram accounts, vote in free elections and read uncensored newspapers. War is no longer something visited upon impoverished and remote populations. It can happen to anyone. So again... The, the implication here is like, well, when it was the others, they're really, they really weren't worthy of our sympathy, or certainly not this degree of sympathy. But now that like I relate to them, because they look like me, well, now it matters. Uh, it's, it's really gross. Again, this isn't to say that what's happening in Ukraine doesn't matter. It matters massively. But I just wish the same uh, concern for civilian lives and well-being extended to uh, the victims of Western imperialism and not just the victims of Russian imperialism. Okay, and then we got another one here. More of this, quote, Now the unthinkable has happened to them. This is not a developing third world nation. This is Europe. So in other words, like, yeah, yeah, when the war's over there, whatever, it's one thing. But now it's here, and now it counts. No, it counts there as well, for the love of God. Again, I'm not saying this to do whataboutism, because both of these, these versions of imperialism are condemnable. But I'm doing it to point out, in our media, only one version is worthy of this degree of contempt. And that's disgusting. So, anyway, there you have it. Um, I, I could go on and on here. I could probably dig up horrendous Russia-Ukraine takes all day, but I just wanted to give you a little taste. And, again, it's times like these where you stop and think, Jesus Christ, you feel like you have no political home? Because there's a bunch of idiocy coming from every single ideological faction, from all these different perspectives. And I guess it's astounding to me that, like, any of these people took any of these positions or said these things. Because it doesn't require that much thought to realize that the things you just saw are absurd.